We are so excited that you've joined us today. You're about to hear a message from our pastor, Mike McFadder from the Crossing Worship Center. Please make sure you are following us on YouTube and Facebook. We pray that this message draws you closer to the Lord and encourages you. We are going to go to the Word of God, John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20 is where I'm going to be reading verses 19 through 28. And I want you to read along with me. It's a story about Jesus and him talking to his disciples, the men that had committed themselves to know him. They had made great decisions in their life to find the will of God. They had made the hard decisions. And I know this morning that if you were in the house of God, you've had to make a choice to be here. There was absolutely nothing out there this morning that was going to make it easy for you to come. You're going to have to struggle to even get your eyes open. That's going to take God or an alarm clock. <laughs> because if not, you're going to be like me. I thought I slept through Sunday. I woke up Saturday morning, 8.15, looked at my wife, and I said, Have you lost your mind? What's going on? Didn't you think to wake me up? And she said, What are you talking about? I said, I am now late. I had a meeting before church. She said, Mike, it's Saturday. <laughs> I said, Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> she said, no, you're crazy. <laughs> she did. She just looked at me like, you lost your mind. But I hope I'm not the only one in the world that's losing the day here and there. <laughs> Why are you saying that, Pastor? Because busy out there, isn't it? Busy time, busy. It's a busy world. And a man told me one time, busy is, is that Business tells us that we are under Satan's yoke, being too busy, power of demonic spirits to overcome you in the spirit. To, that's why I'm glad God said, take one day of a week, keep it holy, make it about me. Don't gather more than you need, I'll take care of it. Give me that one day, I'll take care of the other six for you. Amen? That's why I'm glad you're here, all of us, whoever, all of you that made it here this morning. So we go back to the word, John chapter 20, verse number 19. It said, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples assembled for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst. He said unto them, Peace be with you. <laughs> He said, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Ghost. If you, for, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, which was called the twin, that was his nickname, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. It's important this morning. That's an important verse in all of this. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. We have seen the the Lord. Now, that, I'm going to stop here and just give you some understanding of where we are in this. Jesus has already died. They had watched him die on the cross, and they'd watched him being beaten, and they, they, they finally gave up the ghost and died on the cross. And they tuck him down and wrapped his body and put it in the tomb. Sunday has already come. They had run to the tomb and saw the emptiness of that tomb. And now they are gathering together, and Jesus is showing himself back to them after he had been resurrected. That's what's going on right now. So when he says that, hey, the disciples said to them, we have seen the Lord. <laughs> he said to them, unless I see in the hands, this is Thomas, unless I see in his hands the print of his nails and put my finger in the print of his nails, I put my hand into his side. If I don't do all of that, I will not believe. You know why he said all of that? Because Thomas 
was a man that was struggling with his beliefs. But Jesus, when he talked about this man, Thomas, did not name him Doubting Thomas like we did. We didn't give him a nickname of Doubting Thomas. His nickname was a twin. But in this system and in this world, if you ever come up on a circumstance of life where you have trouble believing, most of the time the system will just kick you out. But see, one of the things about Jesus Christ is that he is not about the moment. He is about eternity. You see, a lot of times we put too much emphasis on the moment. Maybe you're sitting here this moment and you're not as strong in the Lord as you would like to be. Maybe there's been a time when you've been stronger in the Lord. Maybe there's been a time when your belief system was on a higher level than it is right now. I don't know what's going on, but I will tell you this, that life will bring you down. It'll make you doubt everything you know about God. Why? Because God's not on the timetable of this world. A day with him says a thousand years and one thousand years one day. God's basically saying, I've got your days in your hand. And if you don't get in this book, you're going to be confused with life. But in this book, I will tell you what's going on. Now, a man said, I don't know if I don't put my finger in his side or in the nails. I'm not believing. Now, he's not talking some crazy joker out there on the street. He's talking to one of the 12 disciples. Sometimes a disciple can get into a situation. It's hard to believe. It's hard to understand what's going on in life. And so that passed by. Eight days now has passed. And after eight days, his disciples were gathered again inside. And Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came and the doors beginning to shut and stood in the midst and said it to him again, peace to you. <laughs> I don't know about what that meant, but I can tell you Jesus has said it three times in about six verses. I wonder if he looked at them disciples and said, I, I can't even talk to you if you're going to be this stressed out. If, if you're going to be this stressed out, I, I can't talk to you. So I got to speak to you, peace. He wasn't just talking about in the world. He could give them peace in their mind and their spirit. And he said to Thomas, aren't you, I, I, that's one of the things about God I'm so thankful for. He doesn't pass up the one that's struggling. You say, you know, I feel like sometimes God doesn't know where I'm at. I feel like sometimes that I'm not the one in the room God cares about. Seems like my life is not important to God. But I want you to know something, Jesus, when he come back after eight days, he looked and he said to Thomas, all right, Mr. Mr. Doubter, Mr. Guy that needs proof. <laughs> you say, I'm at the place this morning, I need some proof. <laughs> he said, reach your finger in here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it in my side. And do not be unbelieving anymore, but believe. You know, I'm here to tell you this morning. He said, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Didn't take much, did he? All he needed was a little proof. All he needed was another something from God. He just needed God. He needed Jesus to know, I need some help to, to believe where I'm at. I need some proof. My message title this morning is, I need proof. Ah, uh, you may say that's for the world, that's for the system out there. No, this is right in that upper room with these 12 disciples and life had gotten hard and difficult for them to believe anything past what they could see. They had seen the empty tomb where Jesus was. Christ had met with Mary and Jesus had visited his disciples. Why did he do all of that? That they might believe on him. That was the whole point. Why would he show up afterwards? Why didn't he just stay in heaven? He come back down here and met with them at the, at the show on the empty tomb and met with Mary. Jesus visited his disciples and told them, visited 500 people thereabout. Why? So that they would believe he is who he said he is, that he is the son of God. 
He do you know from your experiences with God that he's real? I want to ask you again. I'm not talking about your Christianity. I want to know, Christian, if your experiences have proven to you that he is who he says he is. Is it just the head knowledge of theology or an ideology? Is it something just in your head? Or have you had some way of some experience where maybe you doubted and God said, take your finger and put it right here. Let me show you something. God doesn't mind proving who he is. I want you to know God has no problem answering your questions about who he is. He created a pine tree with some pine cones on it. He put a bird in that tree. He put a fish in that water and he put grass out there on the ground. And if you got eyes spiritually to see, you know no man can do that. That takes God. That's the reality of whatever it is. If you need a little proof, God said, I got some for you. I'm not going to leave you out there wondering if I'm real or not. I don't know about you, but I sometimes I let things get in my mind shouldn't be there. At 5 o'clock this past weekend, I don't think it was Friday morning, about 5 in the morning, I, I woke up, I was wide awake. I'm not, I'm not usually up that time of day. I'm usually up at 5. You know, just my, my days and nights get mixed up. I'm like some new baby sometimes. But I, I, was, I, was, I was wide awake. And I went to the refrigerator to got a little drink, and my throat was dry, probably sleeping with my mouth open. And it's dried out, so I went down and got me some something to drink. And, and on my way back to the bed, the oh, Holy Ghost, I felt him talk to me. He said, used to, you'd get up and talk to me a little bit. I shook it off. I said, that's not the Lord, because I headed back to that big old pillow. I got me a king-size bed. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was headed back. God said, used to, you'd stop by and talk to me a little bit. I said, is that you, Lord? <laughs> said, you used to wouldn't ask me that. Not you, me. So I headed off to my office where I have an office slash prayer room. I opened the drapes and the light was shining down out of that room into a, a little uh, flower bed. My wife and I had planted. It's got some roses in it. I sat down on the chair and didn't close my eyes. I wasn't down praying, speaking in tongues. I was there. I said, all right, you, you want me here? you got something to say. I'm here to listen. And, the Bob, and the God began to talk to me. And a lot of what you're hearing this morning was things he said to me. Now, you either believe that's true or you think I'm up here to kind of sensationalize this message. I'm here to tell you what I'm telling you is true. I, I don't know the voice of God any better than anybody else, but I will tell you this as somebody that does know the voice of God. He might not talk to you every day like you think he should, but I promise you if he wants your attention, he can talk to you and you will know it's him. Yeah, you, you'll know it's him because he created you whether you believe in him or not. He knows how to get your attention and he got my attention and I sat there and as I sat there he began to talk to me about the world and how things were disappointing to him. He said, I created this whole world for the, for the, for the beauty of mankind. I did it all for you. I know everything, Mike. He said, you live in a world of questions and I've got every answer to every question. He said, but nobody will come talk to me about it. Nobody wants to talk to me. He said, you need an answer, son. And I'm the only one who got that answer. As I began to listen to him, I looked on that, on that rose bush, and there was a praying mantis. I'm talking about it's still dark. That light was shining. He moved just a little bit. I was just looking in that area. And he said, do you see that praying mantis? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, he was there before you got up. He said, if you hadn't to come in this room because I told you to, you wouldn't know he's there. But I knew he was there. But because you listened to me and you obeyed me, I showed you something you didn't know before. And then he said, do you know what that praying mantis eats? I said, no, sir. He said, I do. Do you know how he gathers moisture? I said, no, sir. He said, I do. 
But he said, I'm here to tell you, I'm taking care of that praying mantis, whether you do anything or not. I've got this world under control. I want you to know, he said, I'm God, and I've got the answers to everything. If I could just get people to know how much it is I love them. I want to help hurting people, he said. There are people that don't know me, Mike. I can't reach them. I, I try and love them, but they won't receive me. They sense me, but they won't receive me. Somebody's told them I'm not real. Life has told them this is not worth living. And now it's moved into the church where now even us are looking and saying, I don't know if he's real or not. John said this about him when he was thrown into prison. He said, go back and ask Jesus, are you the one we're looking for or do we look for another? When he answered him, he didn't answer him and said, yes, I won't tell you I'm Jesus. He said, my action speaks for who I am. He said, the lame walk and the blind see and the dead live again. He said, if that's not enough proof, then you need to find somebody else to believe in. But I'm telling you that I've proved who I am, John. And John said, that's him. That's him. Oh, that's him. You know when it's him. And he began to talk to me about you and this message this morning. And I'll ask you again, do you know from your experience with God that he's real? Or do you live only from your teaching? Does your teaching have to work for you or do you have a praying mantis experience that I'll never forget it I didn't know I couldn't even see him till he moved God said he was here before you knew it how much don't you know I said, you just don't say nothing when he's talking Jesus wants your faith in him to be secure I'm asking you, believer, is your faith in him secure? Is it built off of the experiences of life that you know he can save you because he has saved you? Do you know that he is the healer because he's healed you? Yeah, I'm talking about somebody with a testimony this morning. And not just about being a Christian. I've been a healed man. I, you said, that man looked at them. He said, one man in the Bible said, he said, I was once blind, but now I see. They said, well, who did this? He said, that man, Jesus. And they come to him and said, he's not real. He said, they said, he's a false prophet. He said, I don't know whether or not he's a false prophet or not. But one thing I do know is I couldn't see, but now I can. I wish the people that just couldn't see, that now can see, the people that's been redeemed that can just say I don't know what you got to say about him but one thing I got to say about Jesus is I was lost but now I'm saved I was blind but now I can see why because Jesus proved himself to me through an experience Praise God Almighty. It wasn't just kneeling down in a sawdust floor. It's when I got up and God began to work in my life and let me see the Lord. Like them disciples said, they said to Thomas, we've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. And they come to him trying to tell him. So it would encourage him. If you'll find out and see the Lord, you won't be so easily moved. Problem with some of us, we ain't seen the Lord in 20 years. That's why we don't want to serve him much anymore. Our experience is old. Come on, folks. I'm not expecting talking about people that don't have nothing to talk about. I don't talk about people that know a little bit about Jesus. On whatever he did for you in the past, what was that he did? He did that so you'd see him. Has there been a time when you served him more than you're serving him now? Let me tell you why we drift off, because we hadn't seen the Lord. I'm telling you, after that moment in that bedroom, praying and talking to God for a few minutes, he ignited a flame in me. It brought back memories that I knew that God, only he he could have done what he did. I've had stories like playback in my mind. Things I've seen God do. I won't even tell you about them because just, just waste time talking to, to some of the stuff about it. But I'm here to tell you, if you see the Lord, you won't turn aside or be discouraged as much as you are. Yeah, if it's nothing but a theory or an ideology or cultural beliefs, then Jesus is not going to be much to you. But if he can say to you, i got something to prove to you, and I'll prove to you I am who I say I am. I am the Son of God, and without me you're dead and doomed and destined for hell. But if you believe in me, it's not just about hell. I've got something for you today. 
So let me ask you a couple questions as we move forward. Are you a doubting person? What's caused you to doubt? What's the reality of your doubt? It's probably circumstances. It's probably life. Something's happened. Probably something happened, made you question. God didn't come when you wanted to. didn't move like you wanted him to. We won't get into all of the reasons for that because I remember saying to the Lord, scriptures like this would pop back up in my mind. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't hear me. And I'm, that plays out in my mind. I don't know what plays out in your mind, but that kind of stuff plays out because the devil reminds me always that much of the time I have iniquity in my heart. So the, so the devil says, see that scripture telling God not listening to your prayers. Jesus wasn't in the room when Thomas said, unless I put my finger there, I'm not going to believe. Jesus wasn't in the room when he said, unless I feel his side, I'm not going to believe. Jesus was not in the room, folks, until that time, eight days later. Thomas was not in the room. He didn't hear Thomas say that. But I'm here to tell you that Thomas made some comments. And God said, I'll prove to you I am who I say I am. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 through 27. It gives us some illustrations of some very powerful things. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months. See how he starts off the story. Starts it off, not with ideology or teaching, starts it off with experience. How does Moses know he is who he is? When I was three months old, he, my mama put me in a bull rush, pitched that thing, slung me out into that crocodile-infested river only to be picked up by Pharaoh's daughter and said, this is not one of my children, but there's a Hebrew woman. He said, go get the Hebrew woman. And he ended up picking up Moses' own mother. He said when Moses was born, he's hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. He was going to kill every baby, you know. By faith, Moses, going to the next thing, became of age. He refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughters. What he's saying is he's raised in Pharaoh's house, but he said, I'm not going to stay here in this palace. I got something else. I'm not living for this world. I'm living for heaven. See, until you get a picture of heaven, this world becomes everything to you. But if you get a picture of, I got a mansion for you, sir. I got a streets of gold, walls of jasper. I got the gates of pearl. I want you to know something, boy. What you got on this earth is poor. You're poor and broke down compared to where I'm trying to take you. I'm trying to get you heavenly minded so you can get off of your rust that's on your pickup truck. And the fact that you got to cut your grass every week and everything dies in the winter time. I want you to know where I'm at. Everything Everything don't die. Everything don't have to be painted again. Everything won't rust where I'm at. But I can't get you high enough to encourage you with that because all you see is all of this down here and it's discouraging you. Why? Because you won't let me get you higher. Choosing rather to suffer the afflictions of the God and people enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Mm. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he looked to the reward. Look at this. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. <laughs> How did he make such decisions? I saw somebody that was invisible. Now you tell your friends that on the job site and they're going to call babe behavioral and get you toted off because you're seeing things. I am seeing things. Now Moses didn't just make this stuff. He had an encounter with God. Genesis 3, 2 through 6. And I'm going to pull it up but I'm not going to belabor this. I'm just going to tell some of you, I'm going to tell you this because you need to hear it. Now I'm talking to Christians this morning. And a woman said to the serpent, why eat the fruit of the trees of the garden? Let me just move on. What happens from here is if you and I don't have an encounter with God, if we don't have an encounter with God, if you don't have an, a burning bush experience. 
if you don't have a moment, which was in Exodus chapter, it's my fault, God. It, it, that scripture said, and Moses saw a burning bush, and he said the bush didn't burn up. Wasn't odd that he didn't see burning bush. That's not what was odd. The fact that he didn't burn up. He caught something. He said, this is odd. This is odd. I'm sitting in my office looking at a praying mantis at 5 o'clock in the morning, move on a rose bush outside. This is odd. And see, there's a moments in life where you have to say, if you want to go lay down in bed, go lay down. You'll miss everything about God. I said, if you want to be absent from the things of God, go be absent. But I'm telling you, you're going to miss everything God has for you. The reality of it is, is that when he was there, he said, I turned aside and went to see it. And that's when God spoke out of the burning bush, told him to take off his shoes, for the ground just standing on made it holy. What made it holy? The fact that God was there. This church means nothing if God's not here. This church has no answers for you if God's not here. But if God's here, listen to me, church, this is holy ground. Come on, folks. You want to walk out of this church, and I'm just talking because that illustration happened this morning. If people don't like whatever's here, I'm here to present Christ. I'm not here to present the best worship team. I'm not here to present the best-looking sanctuary. I'm here to present a God that can do anything. And from there, it won't matter what they sing as long as it's something from their heart. Worship comes from your heart. It's that kind of thinking that's got the church in trouble where the pew members try to tell the platform what to do. And if you don't do it my way, i got the power to walk out. I said, baby, hit the road. This is you that's going to miss. I can tell you this much. Those of you who have stayed the course, Jesus Christ is here. And if he's here, you can look for great things that are about to happen in your life. Is your God alive? Is your God all powerful? Is your God able to save? Or do you live by the hope so? Jesus wants you to know, not hope. Paul said that my preaching is not just with, with enticing words, but with demonstration. Preaching has to have demonstration. Part of the things now is we're just teaching. We're just teaching a few things, and you go home without demonstration. Well, pastor, what do you demonstrate? I'm here to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit this morning to make you effectively hear what God's got. I'm just telling you, Jesus is saying, do you believe I'm in this room? <laughs> If you don't, you, I don't know where to start other than tell him, I don't believe you're here. But I can tell you, I'm not staying here if he ain't here. There'll be nobody behind this pool because I'm taking my family and going if Jesus ain't here. I'm not stuck to this building. I'm here because I believe it's the will of God to be here. Is that why you're here? I have a lot of people. I've talked to several of them this week, and I hope they listen to this message. I know because they said it out of their mouth to me. Pastor, we believe we're supposed to be in that church. I said, well, why in God's name ain't you here? Well, well, mama. Mama what? Well, I, yeah, but that's, we just, that's been my church all these years. I said, well, then why didn't you tell me you're supposed to be here? Keep that stuff to yourself. What you're saying is, is I ain't got the guts to tell them because if I move in the will of God, I'm going to lose mom and granny and granddaddy. Everybody's going to not talk to me no more. I'm here to tell you, God's not interested in whether or not you end up with all the friends you've got right now. What he's interested in is, is do you care me to tell you, go do the will of God. And those of you that will do the will of God, he said, I've got great plans for you. But if you don't want to do it, you don't have to, folks. He is not going to wrangle you up and make you do it. You have to obey the Lord. John 20 and verse 24. And I want to read it just real quick because I want you to hear this is my last couple points. He said to him, he was absent, not present. Circumstances of life had changed. Jesus had died and it discouraged him. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. So you find yourself in a situation where he was not there. Statistics, I'm going to give you some statistics. Statistically speaking, a child is better and more balanced when mom and dad reside in the home. It's not Pastor Mike's, not out of John or Ephesians or Galatians. This is the Institute of Family Studies. He said, that study said, where children are raised by the biological parents have a substantially higher rate of avoiding poverty and prison. 
they have a substantially higher rate and attending and graduating from college. Pew Research said church attenders tend to be happier and more engaged in society. Harvard School of Public Health said church attendees were less likely to have mental health issues, less likely to use drugs, alcohol, or die prematurely. That's from the Harvard School of Public Health. Not Ephesians, Galatians, Corinthians, Genesis. It, they did a study of humanity and they said it is absolutely amazing when you engage in where you're supposed to be with God. Whether you're in the right church, the fact that you're here this morning is the power of God on the choices you've made and God saying to you this morning, I'm going to show you something. But if you don't see that power of the fact that you got up, your circumstances didn't keep you out, your situation didn't keep you out, you're here, you're here, so now you don't have to be a statistic. Jesus said, and truly, Jesus did many other signs in presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. <laughs> See if you can find 26 for me, Josh. He confronts in the absence. Jesus, when Thomas had told him, said, Thomas told him, said, I, you know, I'm not going to believe unless I see it with my own eyes. He said, I'm not going to believe. Well, then when Jesus shows up eight days later, when Jesus showed up eight days later, he said to him, he said, and after eight days, his disciples were again, again inside, and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus said, the door being shut, he stood in the midst of them. He said, peace to you. And he said to Thomas, I say, he said to Thomas, verse 27, he said, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. And do not unbelieve, be unbelieving, but now believe. And then he said, the reality of that is this. Thomas asked for proof. And God gave it to him. He used his own words. I wonder what he thought, because when Thomas said that, Jesus wasn't there. So when Jesus shows back up, he says, Now, Thomas, you asked to see my scars. See, see, Jesus knows everything about us, no matter where we stand. No matter where you're at, he knows that mind. He hears us. So I'm asking, sometimes you can let circumstances of life get so difficult that sometimes we say things that we probably don't mean to say because life gets hard, amen? Difficult times come. We're all in them. Everybody's facing something. We all have issues. And sometimes because of your circumstances, you just need a little extra proof. And that's where Thomas was. Jesus wanted Thomas to have what he needed to believe. Let me say it again. Jesus wanted Thomas to have what he needed to believe. If you need the proof, I got it. I'm not leaving you out here to have blind faith in nothing. I want you to ask me. Ask me. I'll heal you. I laid in my house. The other night. Been a lot happened to me this weekend. I went to bed. My wife and I was after Thursday night. And I went to bed, me and her. I woke up about 2.30. As soon as I sat up on the edge of the bed, I felt a pain in my back. And I, you know, I got a bad back, but it wasn't the same. I've had a bad back for 30 years. It wasn't the same. I have something different. And I went on. It kept, within a few minutes, it got excruciating to the point I, I couldn't take it. I told us the pain so intense, it makes you want almost panic. I don't know what to do. I, she said, are you all right? I said, no, I'm not all right. I didn't know what to do, so I turned the hot shower on, went and got in the shower, and it seemed to relieve it some, and it moved around into my abdomen, and I said, Lord, I, I don't know what's going on, but my God, I mean, I'm broke out in a cold sweat. I'm hurting, and I, I, I told her, I said, I don't know what's going on, and I, you know, all you can do then just said, Lord, help me. Jesus. It's amazing what kind of little prayer come out of you. I stand in the shower. I said, oh, Jesus, help me. Help me, Lord. And that running, what, so I, anyway, I couldn't say this. So I got it. She said, well, do you want me to rub you, run you a tub and get it in the hot water? I said, I know I don't want to sit in the tub. I don't want to sit in the tub. And I've had blown. I said, I think I'll get in the tub. <laughs> so she didn't run the hot water. And I went in. I said, I don't know. I got to get off my feet. When I got off my feet and I laid back in that tub, seemed like the pain went from about a seven or eight down to a three. It didn't go away, but it did, didn't lose the intensity. 
So I was laying, I said, oh, thank God for that. I was talking to Jesus, and I was just praying, but one night I'm moaning, oh, mm. She said, he don't do pain well. I said, I don't, oh, mm. Oh, she wasn't in the room. She said, anything I do for him? Oh, no. Mm-mm, turn the light off. I just let me sit here. I'd move my legs a little bit, keep the water, hot water moving, you know. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, help me, Lord. I laid in that tub. I'm not exaggerating. I let the water out. I lay there two hours, heating and reheating that water. Two hours. Finally started shriveling up in feet and hand and everything else. I said, I've got to get out of this water. But I felt like I thought, well, when it gets a little weight off of me, I feel like when that water, you know, makes you a little more buoyant, your weight got off of me. I felt like, so I told her, I said, go get my, go get my back brace. And so she did, and she went and got it. When I stood up, and I said, now put it around the pool. She said, don't you want to dry off? I said, no, put it around. I hurry, it's coming. It's starting to happen. So pull it around the top, and we'll get to I hear it come. Here it come. I just put my shirt on. I said, oh, God, it come here. Come that cold sweat again. It was building back up. I got out of that water. I sat down in that recliner. I said, oh, God. Oh, Jesus, I never, I said, Lord, help me, Jesus. Oh, God, I said, y'all know you can heal me. And I said, you may not choose to do it tonight, but I do believe you can. I said, Lord, I just pray you heal me, Lord. I just pray you heal me. Father, I just pray you heal me. The next thing I remember, that was at about 430. The next thing I remember was Lindsay, it was Thursday, Lindsay was bringing Noah to the house at 730. When the door opened, I woke up. And Leanne said, are you all right? I said, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm all right. I, I, I don't remember going to sleep. I said, I'm, I'm okay. I said, don't hurt right now. You know, you're afraid to move. You know. So, so it got up. That was on that Thursday. Now, when I went in that prayer room on Sunday, the Holy Spirit said to me that morning, he said, I put Adam to sleep. Do you believe I can put you to sleep? You don't have to believe what I'm telling you. He said, I'll put you to sleep, boy. You make your own story. You live your own life. I'm telling you, I'm sweating bullets and pain. I said, God, I don't know if you will or not. I said, no, you can't. Next thing I know, I woke up three hours later and the pain was gone. He said, I took a rib out of, I took a rib out of that boy and made a woman. He said, do you know how I did that? I said, no, sir. He said, nobody else knows it either. He said, nobody knows why I pulled a rib out of him to make her. You can speculate if you want to, but I didn't tell anybody. I know I've done some things in your life you may not understand, but just understand this I can do whatever I choose to do it ain't no trouble for me boy it ain't no trouble you needed me I came didn't I now go tell them people that I proved to you again after 32 years I'm still God and if I want to wake you up put you through it or whatever it is I've had times when God didn't answer me all the way I had to take some medicine to feel better I didn't mind taking enough thank for the doctor I had enough sense to create it but what I'm telling you is this proof if you need proof Truth this morning, God said, I'm ready to give it to you. I'm ready to give you some proof. My last statement is this, John 20, 31, 30 and 31. This is the last thing he said. At the end of this book, he said, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which were not written in this book. In verse number 31, now listen to me because I'm closing. This is the end. But these are written that you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. What he was saying is this book has been written with experiences and examples. He shifted from the story and looked at the current crowd and said, this was all written that you might believe. You that are discouraged, you that need proof, you this morning that are hurting, you need proof. God said, I've got proof. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to follow us on YouTube and Facebook so you don't miss out on any future content from the Crossing Worship Center. Thank you again and God bless.